Uh, Daniel is currently an assistant professor of Sephardic and Iranian studies at Yeshiva University. Uh, he, he studied uh, here at Yale University in the Department of History. Um, his work focuses mainly on modern uh, Iranian history. He's also a, a scholar and knowledgeable in the area of Shia Islam and Iran's religious minorities, or the place of Iran's uh, religious minorities. He did his uh, studies as I said, at, uh, at Yale, did his PhD at Yale. He was also a scholar at Tel Aviv University and a research fellow at the Diane Center for Research on Islam in the Middle East. He was also the Golda Meir Fellowship uh, Scholar at Hebrew University of the Institute of Judaic Studies. And he was, I'm going to mess up this name, sorry, is it actually a few German speakers here? The Wiesen Schofskolleg. In Berlin's Institute for Advanced Study, and he was also at the University of Pennsylvania's Institute for Advanced Judaic Studies. Um, and he's the author of a book that was just this came out in 2007 with, from Stanford University Press, entitled "Between Foreigners and Shiites: 19th Century Iran and Its Jewish Minority." So it's really a pleasure to have him out here with us today. Thank you. I'd like to thank Charles, Dr. Charles Moore for inviting me. Can you hear me? Okay. It's a well-known fact that some elements in the Islamic Republic of Iran exhibit anti-Semitic tendencies. To better understand the rise of these tendencies, I would like us to see them in historical perspective and briefly offer some facts, some four factors as a background to their emergence. So factor number one would be the following. The attitude of Islam, as well as Muslim legal concepts pertaining to the Jews. In the year 651, in the year 651, Iran was conquered by Islam. The approach of Islam and Muslims toward the Jews was based on various factors. One, Muhammad's attitude towards the Jews, at first trying to befriend them, later attacking them and expelling two Jewish tribes from his city, as well as massacring, massacring the men of the third uh, tribe. Two, Quranic perceptions. The Quran includes positive statements about the Jews as well as negative statements. We can speak about these issues later on. Three, Hadith oral traditions, Muslim oral traditions perceptions on the Jews. Some of them are positive, many others nevertheless are negative on the Jews. Four, polemical literature written about the Jews uh, consisting of the following uh, elements. Uh, one, viewing the Hebrew Bible as a divine text that had been abrogated in the face of a more complete and perfect revelations, including Islam. Two, the Hebrew Bible uh, as forged by the Jews. Three, the Hebrew Bible as uh, predicting the rise of Islam and Muhammad. All these are found in the same texts uh, written by Muslims. A fifth element under the first factor of mind dealing with Islam is presidents uh, developed uh, during the conquest of Islam that were adopted by schools, uh, by the different scholars of the different schools of law in Islam. All above, all these uh, five issues are quoted nowadays, very much uh, remembered and learned by Muslims, contemporary Muslims. The Jews, as well as some other religious minorities, are recognized as the people of the book, meriting protection or dhimma in exchange for their acceptance of certain conditions that demonstrated their submission to Muslim rule, the recognition of Islam's superiority, and their dishonor. dishonor. The Rima consisted of a set of stipulations which included the, included the prohibition of constructing new houses of worship and of riding on saddles. The Rimas were obligated to wear all clothes that differed from those of Muslims. Still, compared to the status under the Sassanian government before Islam, the status of the Jews improved under Islam in Iran. Jews now receive protection dictated by the Sharia, the law of Islam. The arrival of the Safavid dynasty uh, oops, the Safavid dynasty uh, took power over Iran in the early 16th century marked a turning point in the history of Iran in general and in the history of its religious minorities in particular. Under the Safavid Shi'is it became the state religion 
state religion. In the like manner of Sunni Islam, Shiism viewed the people of the book residing under Islam as the means and Jews were included in his uh, status. Nevertheless, Shiism has some unique characteristics in this regard. So you can see uh, Vima is there, but there are some uh, unique elements. A hallmark of Shi'i treatment of religious minorities is the concept of nejasat, or impurity. According to this concept, religious minorities, among them uh, the Jews, were perceived as impure, whose touch defies the Shi'i believer. This concept of impurity became ubiquitous and had a tremendous impact on the Jews' lives and daily uh, interaction with larger Shi'i society. It helped segregating the Jews and was used as a pretext for bearing them entrance to the local marketplaces, the bazaars of certain cities. Other issues included this issue of food. Jews, let me put it like that, Shiites were not allowed to consume any food or uh, that were all kinds of food that were, were uh, produced by the Jews, only fr fruits and vegetables, as long as they did not come in touch with water, were allowed for Shi'is to consume. The third element is the issue of marriage. Whereas Sunnis allow Muslim men to marry uh, women from the people of the book, including uh, Jewish women, Shiites restrict this issue and argue that only a certain <coughs> type of inferior, inferior type of marriage is allowed for Muslim men with women coming from the people of the book, Jews included. And this is um, the type of marriage called muta or sire, which is te uh, temporary marriage. A man, a Muslim man, comes to a uh, a woman and signs a contract and getting married with her for a certain limited uh, time period. So this type of marriage is seen as inferior and this inferior type of marriage, inferior to the potentially uh, eternal type of marriage, regular type of marriage, only this type of marriage is allowed with women from the people uh, of the book. Indeed, these concepts apply to the people of the book at large, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, etc. Not only to the Jews. Still, Jews, like other religious minorities, as, uh, minorities are seen as inferior to Muslims, and we have to keep this in mind. So this was one factor number one, as far as I'm concerned. The Muslim views, or specifically Shiite, uh, the attitude towards uh, uh, the Jews. Moving from the legal concepts uh, pertaining to the Jews to the real-life situation, I'd like to introduce factor number two. In the reality of Jewish life under the Safavids, 16, 17, 18 centuries, Jews would be many times harassed, persecuted sometimes, even forcibly converted uh, uh, to Islam. Nevertheless, as opposed to some scholars who would actually draw a line between Shi treatment uh, towards the Jews and these persecutions, arguing that Jews would be persecuted because of the Shi concepts uh, that I just mentioned, I would like to argue that Shiism was indeed at the background, but Shiism cannot really explain all attacks against the Jews. Jews would be attacked in the uh, in Safavid times, uh, due to economic tension, as well as some internal rifts within the community that later on only draw the attention of the Muslim uh, government. Meaning not everything should be ascribed to Shiite religious hatred against Jews. Keep this in mind. By the end of the uh, 18th century, in, 19, in 1796, the Rajar dynasty took over, uh, took over and reigned supreme over much of Iran. Under the early Rajas, 1796 to 1848, Jews suffered from occasional persecution and regular abuse, including blood libel accusations. At times, Jews were forcibly converted uh, to Islam, as was the case with the well-known conversion of the Jewish community of Mashhad in 1839. The Jews of Mashhad uh, led crypto-Jewish life for generations to come following 1839, actually for 150 years, Jews in Mashhad lived openly as Muslims, but at home as Jews, we can speak about that later on, there are many stories about this issue. Indeed, all these persecutions and abuse during early Rajah times apply to other people of the book, uh, and not only to the Jews. Zoroastrians suffered, Christians suffered, and not necessarily only uh, the Jews. Still, in some cases, it seems that uh, the Jews were regarded as inferior to all other religious minorities. And I'd like to quote for you some quotes. This, uh, we have it in front of us already. Uh, this line uh, is actually, the paragraph here that you see is uh, a quotation from the Shah's physician in the early 19th century. 
As you can see, he says the Jews are in the scale of God's creatures, the lowest of white beings. They are the leprosy of creation, they are the uh, degree above dogs. We kill a Jew and say no blood is spilled. They are the abandoned of Allah. Who cares for a Jew more or less? Another quote which I don't have in front of you here, I didn't really uh, write it down in front of you, but I'm going to quote it for you, is from a certain Shiite religious scholar, again early 19th century, who states that the Jews, quote, in all cities and countries are despised and not honored, especially under the Shiite imami creed, so says the Shiite religious scholar. They are extremely subdued and far from any degree of honor. So we have to keep that uh, as well in mind. Some change in the legal status and daily situation of the Jews can be discerned from the latter part of the 19th century onward, largely due to foreign intervention. Right, so we can see that certain uh, foreign uh, Jewish organizations like the uh, Anglo-Jewish Association, the Jewish Board of Deputies in London, Alliance Israeli Universal in France, as well as figures like Moses Montefiore, as well as great powers, France, but mostly Britain, would actually speak on behalf of the Jews. In 1873, equality is granted to the Jews. All that should be kept in mind. Still, Jews continued to suffer from disabilities that uh, uh, after they were removed from other religious minorities, not only that they were attacked and uh, attacks continued, but also certain disabilities that were removed from the Jews, were removed from the Jews only after they were removed from other religious minorities, Christians and Zoroastrians. What I'm trying to say is that one gets the sense that the Jews are a kind of a special, more inferior uh, status uh, uh, related to other religious minorities in Iran. I discuss these issues in my in my book that Charles kindly mentioned. Thus, the situation of uh, the Jews in the 19th century to, to the early 20th century in Iran usually remained stagnant, and Jews would be still ill-treated and harassed on a regular basis, while occasionally even suffering outbursts of violence. In 1905, there was a major attack against the Jews, 1909, 1910, as you can see in front of you. I discussed these issues in an article I published in Iranian Studies around a year ago. The early years of the 20th century were uh, impacted by Iran's first revolution, the Constitutional Revolution, 1906-1911. The enactments of those years uh, revealed some changes for part of the religious minorities, including the Jews. Some, some positive developments did take place. The Supplementary Fundamental Laws of October 7, 1907, opens with uh, the following momentous declaration, quote, The people of the Iranian Empire are to enjoy equal rights before the law, end quote. This was indeed a major break for the Islamic, uh, from the Islamic uh, view of the legal rights of non-Muslims. Other uh, lines, other statements uh, during that time removed, actually abolished the uh, taxes, the specific taxes imposed only on Jews and other religious minorities. The Jizya uh, Jews received representation in the parliament around that time. Nevertheless, still other enactments of the same time period were less uh, forthcoming. For instance, only Muslims could be ministers. Jews, among other religious minorities, were not completely welcome to Iranian society. And indeed, onslaughts continued 1909, Hermansha 1910, uh, Shiraz. Onslaughts mean attacks, massacre, killing, raping, looting, plundering the Jewish community. Addressing the place, uh, sorry, addressing the Jews' place in Iranian eyes, we so far briefly mentioned two factors. One, the attitude of Islam, mainly Shiite Islam, towards the Jews. Two, the actual approach of Iranian society towards the Jews from the 16th century to the early 20th century. Both factors have a long-standing impact on contemporary attitudes towards the Jews and Judaism in Iran, in Iran so we have to keep this in mind, both of them. Entering the 20th century, two further factors should be borne in mind. Number three, the introduction of European concepts of anti-Semitism. Four, political factors among, among which the establishment uh, of the state of Israel. So let, uh, let me move with factor number three. As shown by Saru Sarudi, the late Saru Sarudi, a teacher of mine, secular nationalism was one aspect of Western thought that began attracting some Iranians already during the 19th century. Secular nationalism found expression in two different directions. One, a liberal dire direction that was actually forthcoming to religious minor minorities. Another direction was held by some intellectuals that highlighted the pure, quote-unquote, 
few Iranian elements in their own identity. Arabs and Islam, that were seen as the, the primary foreign reasons underneath Iran's decline, were regarded, uh, according to this line, as Semite, whereas Europeans and their civilizations were seen as Aryan. The followers of this uh, trend read the linguistic divisions of languages into Turkic, Semitic, and Indo-European in racial terms, which allowed them to dissociate themselves from the Semitic and Turkic stocks. Such concepts found currency under the Pahlavi regime. Reza Shah Pahlavi, that's, this is the fellow in front of us, ruling in between 21, 5 to 41, he came to power in 21, 25, he actually made himself a Shah. Founder of the Pahlavi dynasty was first and foremost committed to modernizing Iran. <coughs> Constructing uh, railroads and factories, enlarging the bureaucracy, strengthening the army, and investing in the education, agriculture, and industry of the country. The ideology for uh, this enterprise was nationalism, secular nationalism. Secular nationalism came at the expense of Islam, and this was good for the Jews, because now, much more, much more than before, the Jews were perceived as Iranians, whose religious persuasion was their own private affair. And indeed, just in a line, I should say that some Jews started to really get better positions and uh, become part of society in different uh, ways. This process, however important, should not be overrated, as simultaneously Reza Shah's regime increased the racial awareness of the Iranian people by emphasizing and glorifying pre-Islamic Iran, pre-Islamic times. Some Iranian intellectuals and authors, occasionally under the influence of Artur de Gobineau, emphasized the Aryan extraction of the Iranians, thereby asserting that those who are not Aryans, such as the Jews, were not included in the reawakening nation of Iran. Furthermore, the Iranian regime under Reza Shah approached Nazi Germany. From 1936 onward, hundreds of Germans disguised as tourists arrived annually in Iran. German lecturers, teachers, and experts came to Iran to teach. Nazi lecturers were sent to speak on the supremacy of the Aryan race. In 1936, the Nazi regime declared that the Iranians are pure Aryans, thereby exempting them from the Nuremberg laws of a year earlier. In 1937, the head of the Iranian parliament, Esfandiari, even visited Hitler. By 1940, Iran's by 1940, Germany's share in Iran's foreign trade had reached some 45.5%, more than any other foreign country. Iran became the refuge place for the pro-Nazi premier, former premier of Iraq, Rashid Ali Galayani, and for the uh, and for Amin uh, Haj Amin al Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem. Baharam Shah Rukh, the Zoroastrian Iranian Nazi broadcaster of the Berlin Persian broadcasts. Uh, used to vilify the Jews, he exposed uh, the supposed uh, Jewish origins of influential figures in Iran and emphasized the super superiority of the Iranian race. By 1946, one expert of Iranian studies could argue that to some extent the Jewish situation was then worse than in the past. In the past, one's religious affiliation was the single most important factor determining one's status. Consequently, a Jew could convert to Islam and upgrade his or her own status and become part of the majority. Now, in 1946, by contrast, the most important factor was one's race. Conversion to Islam would not make much of a difference as a Jew was a Semite even after conversion to Islam. This racist rhetoric could only invite pressure on the head of the Jews and indeed, anti-Semitic outbursts were seen uh, as uh, recorded by uh, the late uh, Arnold Netzer. For instance, in Passover 1946, the Jewish community of Rash, northern Iran, faced a, bl faced a blood libel accusation. Please note, it's Passover, again the same well-known uh, accusations of the Jews as supposedly uh, using uh, the blood of innocent kids for uh, baking their matzah. Similarly, the allegations were made in 1947 and 48 in Persian newspapers, so that was really rather common. Following the ousting of Reza Shah in 1941, various parties came into being, some of them with racist tendency and overt anti-Semitic ideology. 
one of these parties, Sumka, uh, headed by Dr. Monshizadeh, argued the following. Dr. Monshizadeh, in one of his books, argued the following, that the Juhuds, which is a kind of a pejorative term referring to Jews in Persian, Juhuds, uh, the Juhuds uh, can establish their, their state. We will, we will have some uh, correct relations with the Eastern State of Israel, but we will not allow the Juhud to be or become Iranian." End quote. In the latter part of the, uh, of the 20th century, the, uh, following the fourth factor comes, uh, is seen on, it starts to play its role, and let us speak about that. In the latter part of the 20th century, anti-Jewish feelings were harbored in addition to the above factors, three above factors, due to political reasons. The establishment of Israel on uh, supposed Muslim lands caused Muslims at large, including Shiites, to get involved in the question of Palestine in all sorts of way, ways. One example is that in 1947, Ayatollah Abu Ghassem a well-known Ayatollah, called upon Muslims to join their brethren in fighting in Palestine against this uh, the developing uh, newly uh, almost emerging state of Israel. The ever-growing Arab-Israeli conflict influenced in other ways as well. The conflict was seen by some Muslims through religious lenses as a conflict between Muslims and Jews, Islam and Judaism. In this context, Jews and Judaism were criticized and defended as, as constituting an old problem already from the rise of Islam from the days of Muhammad, with whom I mentioned earlier on. Regarding the teachings of the sorry, regarding the teachings of the uh, teachings of the past as a role model, an example of the, for the present, these Muslims read their own earliest sources, Quran, Hadith, and so on, in the light of the present conflict. As a matter of, of fact, the contemporary contemporary concern over Palestine Israel leads this branch of Muslims to distort the past. In reading the Quran, they would focus on those verses and only of those verses that depict the Jews in a negative way while ignoring some positive statements of the Jews. One of the sentences that I love quoting is uh, in chapter 5, uh, verse 82, They are going to surely find that the worst enemies of Islam are the Jews and the politics. To these days, they love quoting this uh, line while again ignoring the other uh, positive statements about the Jews, and there are some positive statements about the Jews. Even serious Muslim religious scholars, such as the late uh, Alama Muhammad Hussein Tabatabai, who died in 1981, occasionally connect between the Jews of Mosaic times, or of Muhammad's time, and the Jews of the 20th uh, century. Following Quranic verses, Tabatabai occasionally deals in his 20 volume Quranic commentary with the Jews. In some places, he does not address the Jews mentioned in the Quran only, but moves on to offer his own thoughts on contemporary Jews, thereby drawing a line between the past Jews, I'm sorry, between the line past Jews' negative characteristics as seen in the Quran, and or, uh, that of contemporary Jews. And I have some examples with that, we we'll speak about that later on. Reading the present into the past, that is distorting the past, is demonstrated in the recently produced film Yusuf Payambra. The story, and this is you know, part of it, that's, you know, the story of the Prophet uh, Joseph, his dreams and his uh, imprisonment, and later, preeminence in Egypt. In one episode, the sons of Jacob fight a Canaanite boy over his land. Jacob then rebukes his son, stating that before the children of Israel, that is his own son, came to Canaan, there were, uh, there were that in that land of Canaan, other people who owned the land. This, I would argue, seems to be a latent reference to the contemporary conflict over the land of Canaan, Palestine, Israel. Furthermore, this is still not anti-Semitism, but the following would be. Furthermore, Judah, the forefather of the Jews, is depicted in a very negative light in the film. He is the mastermind behind, according to the film producers, He's the mastermind behind Joseph selling. He beats him up severely in a kind of a very uh, ugly way, I should say. Uh, he never fully regrets his supposed misdeed, misdeeds towards Joseph. At the end of the movie, the very last line of the movie, the producers of the movie put in uh, Judah's mouth a sentence that indicates that the children of Jacob will be called Jews, 
in the future, thereby making a clear connection between Jews, uh, uh, Judah's negative image throughout the film and the later Jewish people. That's a very long uh, the series, some 10 hours. It's found some 45 episodes. A inter um, highly interesting piece describing this uh, biblical uh, story in, uh, along Shiite lines, which is very interesting, I should say. Uh, Khomeini, the real, real founder of the Islamic Republic, Republic uh, in Iran. Before the revolution, Khomeini used to say that the Jews challenged Islam from its inception, disseminated anti-Muslim propaganda, or that the Jews want to take over the economy of the world, all well-known anti-Semitic arguments. In his later statements, he made a distinction between Jews and Zionists. Jews, according to this line, uh, are protected under Islam, while Zionists are attacked by Khomeini. This distinction is often, but not always, taken by Iranian uh, officials. Speaking about anti-Semitism, obviously in Iran, one should really in the, what examine at least, at least briefly the attitude towards the state of the Jews, uh, the Jewish state uh, of Israel, and uh, whether the attitude of Iran towards this Jewish state should be seen as anti-Semitism or not. I'll speak about that very uh, briefly. So first of all, the authorities, Iranian authorities, as we all know, too long, do not really like uh, the Israel, the anti-Zionist, uh, clearly. Uh, a well-known sentence uh, of Ahmadinejad, the, the, the president of Iran, is that Israel should be, and then we have different translations of this line, should be wiped out of the pages of time. If you Google that, you're going to see there's a major controversy in, in the internet and elsewhere about the exact meaning of it, be this as it may. Some people would argue that it doesn't really mean really killing all of the Jews. We can really put this aside. There are some other very clear indications that uh, they have a problem, obviously, with the Zionist state. Israel is seen as a cancerous tumor, obviously, that should be removed. Uh, they call Israel a little Satan, and Satan is always a, a problem. I remember seeing a kind of a, a photo uh, and showing a missile upon which, on which a line was saying, was saying Israel should be destroyed. And it's on a missile, so there are not too many ways to really read this uh, the picture in any event. For, uh, for, uh, for Iran, Israel actually constitutes a kind of a, a tool to advance certain needs and interests. The very existence of Israel actually constitutes uh, the, a kind of an other, an enemy whose very existence actually unifies may or can or should unify different parties within Iran. So uh, Iran is a kind of a positive uh, thing to some extent for Iran because it, it uses it in order to uh, unify its, uh, uh, the different uh, groups within uh, Iran. Sometimes they use Iran, the Iranian authorities use attacks against Israel in order to advance certain policies, policies calling on the people to come and vote just because if you are not voting, you are actually voting for the Zionist regime. There's nothing basically between, you know, there's nothing to, really to connect between voting in the parliament for the parliament and the Zionist regime, but they would use it again to call people to call uh, the, on to uh, implement different kinds of uh, policies. Sometimes you get the sense that they attack Israel just because they are afraid sometimes to attack directly the West. So it's better to attack Israel which is, uh, uh, which is supported by Western, certain Western uh, countries. Uh, obviously, attacking Israel, another element uh, is that attacking Israel gains Iran reputation, uh, name, uh, it presents Iran as a kind of, projects Iran as a kind of a bold state that is willing to say what many other states in the region, in the Middle East, really think, but never really dare saying explicitly. Whereas Israel, like any other community or country, should not be immune of criticism, Iranian attacks on Israel are at least partly based on anti-Semitic uh, argumentation, one of which, which I'm going to mention now, is that they would argue or they see the Jews uh, as exhibiting any uh, enmity to Islam since Islam's earliest days. Uh, Khomeini was, the, I guess, one of the first ones to say that, that 
you know, from the earliest days of Islam, we have a problem. Islam has a problem, had a problem with the Jews. And then they move a step further to argue that this very fact, the tension between Jews and Muslims back there in the past, actually explain what's happening today, explains that we have a problem with Israel, uh, and that uh, Israel is an enemy. So Israel is seen as a kind of a, a continuation, uh, um, an entity that continues the well-known fights between Jews and Muslims uh, in the past. But more than that, we can come across, maybe before I move on, just a kind of a, a nice point. Ahmadinejad speaks here, Malbar Israel means death to Israel in Persian. al in Israel means death to Israel. In English, they say, down with Israel, which I think in English sounds a little bit milder to some extent. But in Persian and Arabic, they are very clear. al in Israel, death, maut, mafet, like in Hebrew. Malbar Israel, death to Israel. In, in English, they project it a little bit uh, differently. Moving on to discuss briefly anti-Semitism, let me say the following. Evidence of anti-Semitism in Iran is abundant in literature, public lectures, films, internet blogs, and by government pronouncements. One, anti-Semitic literature. In the slide here, you can see that there are different books, anti-Semitic books that were presented in an international book exhibition in Germany in 2005 by <coughs> Iran. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion were published in Iran several times in the 1930s and 40s, early 60s, later on in the 70s, and, and some other various editions since uh, the establishment of the Islamic Republic in Iran, in newspapers and some separate publications. Uh, as I guess some of you are aware of, uh, memory in Israel and Washington uh, they should be actually highlighted the fact that emphasis of the protocols of, uh, of the Elders of the Zion and the Jews attempt to take over Iran and dominate the world are uh, seen in, as well as genocide humanity, are seen in Iranian TV series called The Secrets of, Secret of Armageddon Part 1, Part 2 from 2008, uh, 2009 or so. Two, second element, anti-Semitic le lecture. Beyond lectures, beyond the literature, some figures disseminate anti-Semitic ideas in, in the speeches and public lectures. Dr. Hassan Abbasi is an Iranian politic, uh, political analyst, the head, or at least used to be the head for some time, the head of the Center for Do Doctrinal Analysis in the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, as well as for some time, a theoretician in the office of the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, and, again, for some time, an advisor to President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. In some of his lectures of recent years, Dr. Al-Abbasi argues that various empires of the past were controlled by the Jews. More specifically, he says that the Jews controlled the Achaemenid Empire, 559 to 330 before the Common Era, as learned, he argues, from the biblical book of Esther. Two of the most important figures of this, uh, in this empire, the Achaemenid Empire were Jews, Esther and Mordechai. Dr. Abbasi emphasizes that by the Jews' story, and he says, not by Ahmadinejad's stories, the story, or by uh, the Hezbollah main story, but by the Jews' stories, there occurred a massacre, Rat Le'am, he says, of some 75,000 Iranians, he calls them, at the hands of the Jews. And then he offers the, the following line, Holocaust Yane Im. This is the meaning of Holocaust, he says. Abbasi also argues that the Jews, Esther and Mordechai, pushed the king of the time to attack Athens, uh, as exactly they did uh, with uh, the Mongols. They pushed the Mongols also to attack uh, Islam. The third element is anti-Semitic films. I just mentioned Yusuf Khayamba, uh, the Prophet uh, Joseph, as well as the Secret of Armageddon, part one, part two. Let's move to number uh, uh, four. Following Ahmadinejad's rise in 2005, there are increasingly seen in the blog sphere Iranian, uh, Iranian anti-Semite blogs and internet publications. Some of these blogs focus on Muslim religious and arguments and sources. According to Hamid Tehrani, some of these blogs, quote, some of these uh, bloggers cite a single verse of the Quran, which is this verse that I, which I actually mentioned a minute ago, the Jews are, and infidels are the worst enemies of the uh, Muslims. I'll give you some examples from the, some of these uh, blogs. Uh, one blog argued, uh, argues that the Jews wanted to kill Abdallah, the father of the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, so Muhammad will never be born. 
Uh, according to another uh, blog, this blogger actually attempts to find hidden Jews, arguing that Muammar Gaddafi of Libya is not is actually a Jew. Along the same lines, there are some arguments arguing that Ahmadinejad is of Jewish origins. Obviously, the very attempt to uh, uh, what associate a person or argue that a person is of Jewish descent uh, is in itself an indicative of. Uh, anti-Semitism because by doing that they actually didn't attempt to discredit him and this attempt is not a, a well it's not a new phenomenon already in the 8th century there was a certain Arab writer Al-Muthanna that some other Arab writers disliked because he was really laughing at their origins etc and then he started to argue that he's Jewish so this is a kind of a common theme other blogs love dealing with Hollywood movies one in one internet article asserts that Hollywood, Hollywood, that's the Yahudas. The Hollywood is in the hands of the Jews. It, speci it specifies names of numerous actors and producers who are, according to this space, Jews. One blog says that Harry Potter books and movies try to give a positive image of witchcraft. The, uh, the blogger claims that witchcraft uh, may be contrary to Islam and Christianity, but is attractive to the Jews, which explains why Jews would have some interest in really. Uh, uh, advancing this, uh, this type of movies. Another blog argues that Mickey Mouse movies depict Mickey Mouse in a positive way. Why? Because Jews were used to be seen in Europe as rats. So in order to change their image, Mickey Mouse came into being. Five, anti-Semitic government pronouncements. Following the line of some, uh, some of his predecessors, most notably uh, the Supreme Leader of Khamenei, and in common with uh, certain blogs, President Ahmadinejad has emphasized time and again from different podiums that the mass killing of millions of Jews during the Second World War, the Holocaust, is a myth. Now we have some other again examples for the same line. In December 2006, Iran hosted a convention that officially wished to examine whether indeed millions of Jews had been killed. November 2009, Muhammad Ali Ramin, a Holocaust denier, was appointed to the Vice Minister of Culture in Iran. He said that the he said to have, you know, argued that the Jews are the reason for maladies worldwide and that Hitler was Jewish. Most recently, in August 2010, an internet site in Persian, which was also translated to some other languages, presented the Holocaust cartoons, which is actually based on a 2008 book of cartoons. Uh, uh, and some other sites every now and then are seen or argue similar, you know come up with the anti-Semitic uh, arguments. What is the meaning of Iran's Holocaust denial? So as argued by Mary Litvak, uh, by denying the Holocaust, uh, denial of the Holocaust actually allows Iran to attack the basis on which Israel was established. So Iranians believe that Israel is based on, uh, that the Holocaust is a founding myth of Israel. So if we deny the Holocaust, uh, the entire, you know, entire state of Israel has no reason uh, to exist. Additionally, again argued by uh, Professor Litva, quote, under the pretext of the uh, fabrication of the Holocaust for the sake of Zionism, Iran distorts and denies Jewish history and deprives the Jews of their human dignity by showing the greatest tra tra tragedy as a fraud, even though the Holocaust has nothing to do with the Zionism per se, end quote. So these two arguments I'd like to offer two more uh, of my own. Actually, denying the Holocaust allows Iran to attract uh, other anti-Jewish states and societies to Iran's camp, uh, supporting Iran, Iran's stand on other fronts. For instance, Iran's nuclear drive, meaning by practically attacking Jews and uh, exhibiting anti-Semitism, it's clear that other groups, which are actually other societies, other states, which seem to think the same thing, would be attracted to Iran, and this attraction to Iran, to Iran would be used by Iran to uh, forge a kind of a strong alliance supporting Iran on other fronts, for instance, the nuclear issue. A fourth element, fourth possible uh, incentive that uh, should be mentioned is that denial of the Holocaust as well as attacking of uh, Jews and Judaism serves sometimes as a kind of a very easy way to attack the West uh, or Western countries for whom the Holocaust is uh, an event whose uh, the, what, uh, existence cannot really be a uh, question. To conclude, anti-Semitic anti feelings and imagery were not always common in Iran. 
20th and 21st uh, centuries expressions of anti-Semitism are reflective of the following. One, certain limited Muslim, specifically Shiite perceptions of the people of the book, including the Jews, not only the Jews. Two, uh, it's reflective of past treatment and the denigrating approach and imagery towards the Jews, among other religious minorities, seeing them as filthy liars and worthy of trust and more. Three, it's reflective of introduction of European races, especially anti-Semitic ideology, ideology. Four, it's reflective of political concerns of the fate of Muslim lands in the facing what is regarded as an imperialist onslaught on Islam. And it's also reflective specifically of political concerns over the fate of Palestine and Israel. Anti-Semites in Iran consist of some government officials, Ahmadinejad is an excellent example, but also of some of their adversaries from the protest movement, as well as certain members of society as seen in their blogs. That is, anti-Semitism is apparently a rather broad phenomenon in Iran nowadays. I don't have figures or anything like that, but that's the feeling. Nevertheless, not all Iranians espouse uh, such beliefs. Uh, some of them view the Holocaust as a fact, as well as reject common anti-Semitic uh, anti themes. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, then. I'm going to take the prerogative of asking the first question. Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much for your overview. From a re religious perspective, it, the relationship of the regime of Iran to Israel, is it the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that is of great concern to them? Can you kind of look at it from a religious perspective? Is it possible for Jews, given who, the, who and how they're perceived uh, religiously, can the self-determination of the other, of, of non-Muslims on Islamic land, of Jews, be acceptable from a religious perspective, from the perspective of religion as put, to, put forth by Ayatollah Khomeini, who's the founder of the revolution, but even before the revolution, is there space uh, to accept the self-determination of Jews on Islamic land from a Shiite religious perspective? So I can summarize it as far as I can say, you know, if, you, if we are indeed to focus on Khomeini and his ilk, you would say no, that's it. So uh, it makes my job very easy. Religiously speaking, uh, a Muslim that follows the line of Romania, that espouses this uh, type of uh, uh, Islam, uh, would obviously not accept any entity on Muslim soil. And Palestine is seen as, Palestine and Israel is seen as a Muslim soil, so, so no others can really have any, uh, anything to do with Palestine. Actually, Khomeini himself. Uh, argues, but this is not a religious argument, but he, uh, he does argue that uh, Israel was planted in the midst of a Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, lands and societies and states in order to somehow undermine Islam from within. So he actually views this entire fight religiously. Uh, religiously speaking, he sees uh, a problem with the state of Israel. He, and he is obviously the major ideologue there, even before him. It's not exactly his own new uh, innovation. We, have, we are aware of some connections between certain Iranian figures, and I mentioned Ayatollah Kashani, who died in 1962. Him uh, with uh, Muslim brothers, uh, some of these figures, religious figures, already in the 30s, 40s, had some relations with the Muslim brothers in uh, Egypt, for instance, nowadays in the, uh, in the news. So, uh, religiously speaking, there's a problem here, no doubt. Uh, so, if we are to focus only on the religious differences uh, there, back there in Palestine and Israel, there's a problem for future generations, as well, for our, as well as for our generation. If we focus on supposedly arguing that the, the conflict there is only a conflict over land, resources, water, etc., there maybe there's some solution out of it. But religiously speaking, uh, there's a kind of uh, a gap, a major gap here. Islam would not accept a non-Muslim state, a non-Muslim entity in its midst. The maximum granted by Islam to religious minorities is protection. Vima, which one will may argue is a lot, and indeed in some cases it did protect the Jews. I should be very clear cut on that. Nevertheless, that's the maximum granted uh, to religious minorities, including the Jews. Beyond that is going against Allah, basically. So 
So thank you very much. Just as a footnote, there's some great news that just came out of Washington today. So James uh, Clapper, the head of the National Security Intelligence of the United States, said that the Muslim Brotherhood gave up violence and is a secular movement. So it's great news. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any, any questions? Uh, Uriel and then Professor Reyes. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were about uh, the Jews currently living in Iran and the conditions facing them. Right. There are about 20,000 Jews and uh, Ahmadinejad con uh, consistently makes the claim that it's equal, it's great because they have a representative in parliament. Right. So um, what are your thoughts on that? Good question. In the last 30 years, basically, you know, when the Iranian revolution took place, was successful in 1979 or so, some Jews were executed. The head of the Jewish community there, Habib al ghanayan was executed by uh, the regime, uh, supposedly because of really supporting a corrupt, the previous uh, corrupt regime, as well as being Zionist. Some, in, in the following several decades, some other Jews were executed, which actually void uh, very much the Jewish community there, causing two thirds of the community to run away, immigrate, among many other places to Great Neck, New York, and as well as some other places. Nowadays, indeed, Jews have a representative in the uh, parliament, as well as in the last three decades, no doubt, you have to keep it in mind, which is uh, important. Uh, nevertheless, there are some, of, officially, one cannot argue that they are being discriminated against. I should tell you that some changes were taking place in the last couple of years, for instance, only in 2003 4 a certain law uh, that argued, let me explain the following law. The law is called Dia. Dia means uh, blood money. If the law says basically that if a Muslim kills a Muslim, he needs to, there are different solutions, one of which is to pay a certain amount of money. How about a Muslim killing uh, a non-Muslim, for instance a Jew? Uh, a Shia religious uh, scholars usually uh, uh, give uh, argue that the amount paid by a Muslim for killing a Jew is less than the amount paid by the same Muslim killing a Muslim. Only in 2003, this law was changed, actually equating the amount, the blood price. So this is a positive uh, development, no doubt. Other, uh, an another very important law, inheritance law, arguing that if a Muslim dies and he has a, a non-Muslim relative, the non-Muslim relative takes the entire inheritance at the expense of the even the immediate uh, heirs of this non-Muslim person. This law is still intact, which is which reflects inequality. Putting all this aside, I should really add a further, a further story, I should say. A couple of years ago, three years ago, so a relative of mine actually came from Iran. I'm not going to tell where exactly. And visited us in Jerusalem. So I was telling him, first time, what's happening with Ahmadinejad? So he said, it's okay, it doesn't really bother us. We hear about his statements about uh, the Holocaust, we don't like it, the, guy, the, the community there even came up with a, an open letter uh, against such uh, statements, uh, but bottom line, it doesn't do anything to us. Every now and then, again, somebody is captured and, uh, and accused for being a spy, like 1999, there were some 13 Jews accused from spying for Israel, some of them imprisoned for a couple of, uh, for some time, and then uh, released. Overall, apparently, it's not too bad. And this relative of mine told me we are doing well. It was before the economic crisis, some three, uh, three four years ago or so. So, basically, he was let uh, live. His synagogue was functioning. He was even telling me more, that in the times of the Shah, uh, he could be beaten up in the street. Now, he walks with his uh, yamaka, no one touches him. That's what he says. Now, I can't tell you that this is reflective of all experiences of the Jews, but we have to, to keep it in mind. And again, I would argue that Iran is attempting to really treat its own minorities very good in order to gain this positive uh, reputation abroad. We are good to the Jews. We are not anti-Semite. By being good to these 20,000 Jews in, in Iran, they are practically saying we have nothing against the Jews wherever they are. No, we are good to the Jews. We are actually implementing Islam, offering Vima, they don't say Vima, but offering protection and uh, the different kinds of rights to the Jews. So, uh, just a quick addition. You would say that uh, today it's better than it was before the 1979 revolution? 
I would not say that. That's what this specific radio. I was rather shocked when he said that. Honestly, I would not say that. No, no. Obviously, there's a reason for why two thirds of them left. And again, every now and then, somebody is captured. You're a spy. They are. They live. I think. Uh, you know, uh, I I, start, I teach in uh, Yeshiva University, and there are some boys there. Uh, I guess in your age or so, in the early twenties or so, coming from Iran these days. And when I talk to them, they say there's no future there. Uh, yes, no pressure, really immediate pressure, but everybody realizes, especially the young generation, that there is no future there. Among other reasons, because they had like to uh, get married and there are no girls around uh, in the right age, etc., etc. I have two questions. One is, what is there in the Shia religion as opposed to Sunni that makes the Sunnis less disposed against the Jews in the Shia. And the second question is, you, you didn't really talk very much about the Mosaddegh period and the son of the Shah. How, how, how did that work? He was quite a liberal guy, Mosaddegh, and then was taken over by the, with our help, to the Shah, right. the second Shah. So I wonder, you mentioned, you didn't say anything about the yeah. attitude towards the Jews during those two periods. Of Mossadegh and in which, uh, what was the other? The Shah, he was replaced by right, the right, Shah. Right, okay. Okay, about Shia versus Sunnah, uh, reasons for their hatred uh, towards the Jews are, um, you know, hating more the Jews than the Sunnis, I would, I'm not sure we can really generalize that. Indeed, in law, while dealing with certain legal concepts, you get the sense that the concept of impurity is not followed by Sunnis usually, and indeed that can serve uh, the, what they can really, that can really support your assumption. Nevertheless, if you take certain Muslims nowadays, there are no less uh, the uh, Jew haters or haters than uh, Shiites. Bin Laden, for instance, certain Islamist groups are really major uh, enemies of uh, Jews and uh, Judaism. Now, about the second issue, the days of, uh, of the Shah, the second Shah. That, these days from 1941, following, the, the, following the, the, the overthrow or the ousting of his father, to 1979, in many respects, were the best days for the Jews, one of the best time periods for the Jews ever, as opposed to what this uh, relative of mine said. Overall, that was a major window of opportunity for Jews, as well as some other minorities. The Shah initiated a series of reform known as the White Revolution, investing in the industry, agriculture, etc., etc., education, and Jews were welcome to participate in these major in the sweeping changes. And, but, and the focus was not on their religion or religious uh, persuasion, etc., etc., but on their talents. And indeed, uh, I'll give you some figures indicating how good was it. 1976, for instance, there's a figure saying that there were 600 uh, Jewish physicians in Iran, uh, which actually was, percentage-wise, 6% of the physician population in Iran. And you have to keep in mind that the Jews at that time were only less than a quarter of percent out of the entire population. Same, uh, similar uh, uh, comparison or percentage is given uh, with reference to uh, Jewish professors. In institutions of higher learning and uh, the academia, etc., we have some 80 Jewish uh, professors at that time, around that time. And again, uh, constituting what? Some 4% of the entire body of uh, professors in Iran at that time. And again, this is a lot more than a quarter of a uh, percent which they uh, figured in society at that uh, time. They were doing well. This is the time period in which some of them got really uh, billionaires, basically. And this would actually lead some of them to feel, to have some mixed feelings about, the, about society. They were Jews, no doubt, committed to Judaism, no doubt. However, at the same time, very much Iranian, highly acculturated into Iranian society. And you can find some of them, come across some of them in America nowadays. For these days, they celebrate uh, the Iranian uh, New Year, uh, no rules in uh, the 20 something, 21st of March, around that time. Uh, they have Iranian names. They are really proud. They were and they are still very proud of their uh, Iranian uh, background. 
uh, which actually, again, uh, presents us with a kind of a very interesting case. Uh, the very fact that the regime was more or less uh, allowing the Jews to participate, with a few exceptions and certain uh, limitations, allowed them to feel so much uh, part of society uh, at that time. A few exceptions I'm just hinting at is the fact that Jews could not be colonels in the army, Jews could not really reach high positions in certain uh, ministries, and so on and so forth. Everybody would remember them as Jews, no doubt. Even in the army, they would be drafted into the, into the Iranian army, which is a lot, I should say. Because according to Islam, a Jew cannot really gear the sword or hold a weapon and be somehow be part of the armed forces of the, the, of the army in a Muslim state. Now, under uh, both the father, Muhammad Reza Shah, as well as the son, Reza Shah, Jews would be drafted to the army. My father was in the Iranian army. At the same time, again, the, the, the picture is not completely positive, because at the same time, I can tell you that an uncle of mine was in the army, tells me that he had a, a, a label on his chest saying, giving his first name, his first and last name, and then indicating Kalimi. Kalimi is a nice way to refer to Jews in Iran. Kalima is a word in Arabic. Kalimullah is the one who spoke with God. That's a reference to Moses. And those who follow Moses are called Kalimi, Kalimi basically. So there was an indication on his chest that he is Kalimi. Meaning, what I'm trying to say is that, is that he, was he was actually drafted to the army. That's a lot, a major development, and a positive development. Still, society never forgets. The army, uh, the army or the office of the administration, the authorities never forgot, never really wished to really completely forget one's religious uh, persuasion. He was Jewish. I have also two questions. Um, does the Iranian state recognize also uh, ethnic and national minorities, not only religious minorities? And the second question concerns Holocaust denial. Is it an element of an official educational system like history teaching? Do they teach the Holocaust denial at schools? That's a good question. I'm not aware of that. I know that the image of the Jew is, it's, it's, I don't think that they have a kind of a class or anything mm -hmm. like that. But Jews, when teaching on Islam, are all over. You know, again, let me take you back. It's not a coincidence I mentioned Muhammad uh, from the beginning. All these stories are very much vivid in their memories, and especially in a Muslim state that officially actually speaks about Islam as its religion, attempts to pro propagate Islam, etc. In any class of history, you would come across the Jews, no doubt about that. Why is that? Because Muhammad had some uh, uh, contacts with the Jews. He killed one Jewish tribe, the men of a certain Jewish tribe, Banu Khuraiza, and exiled two other Jewish tribes, uh, Qaimu Khan, Adir. They would come across Jews all throughout. And even before, come speaking about story and history, uh, when uh, in classes of religion, they would, man, they would have to come across Jews. Jews are mentioned in the Quran. So if they teach religion, they have to speak about the Jews because the Quran deals with the Jews in different ways. If they teach the oral traditions, hadith, they have to say something about the Jews. If they teach history, they have to say something about the Jews. So I'm not really sure. I can't tell you whether they have a class called Holocaust denial, well, but mean, obviously the prejudice against the Jews is there, no doubt. What I mean is that when they come to the Second World War and the Holocaust, what do they say then? I can't tell you. I don't really want to say anything. I believe that some of them would uh, will follow this official line, but I suspect that some would not. But I can't tell you, so that's all my speculation. You keep on referring to events in the past right. and the present. Yes. I'm wondering if it isn't necessary to come up with a philosophical view, and that is that there's a clash of civilizations between the West and Islam. They see history differently. They see history as persistent metaphysical truths which keep on recurring as metaphors and events therefore of then and now connect. I, I was looking, uh, the summer I was studying Islam and the Quran, and it appeared to me that it's very different from the Torah, from the, uh, from the Jewish concept of linear time. Their time is quite different. They see it essentially as again and again and again. So there's more, well next week there's going to be a presentation on I guess DNA uh, in, in Islam. But uh, the, the question that I'm raising is this, 
Uh, doesn't one need a broader concept of what's happening in Iran uh, to tie in with what's happening in the Muslim, Muslim mind, the, essentially, the of the persistent Iran. truths so that the Jews become the eternal enemy over time? And that what took place during Muhammad's time is taking place now. And it's a different concept, a different way of constructing history. If one sees history in that way, then what is being done is quite reasonable because they are carrying out the metaphysical truths. What the West is doing is the West sees the change coming in and doesn't see that as metaphysical truth. I would argue that indeed the past is very much vivid in their minds, no doubt. There's an attempt to somehow you know, Muslim uh, what, the views of the past is the, uh, that uh, the past somehow was led astray, if you will. Meaning the golden age, golden era was in the times of Muhammad. In that moment, and there are different you know, arguments were exactly, when exactly, there's a war, civil war, the first civil war in Islam, maybe the Shiite Sunni split that took place uh, there. From, that, from these moments, around the seventh century or so, Islam is not really following the right course of uh, history, and we really need to bring it back while imitating this golden uh, era. However, I would not really you know, I dare differ from your view. I can't speak about a Muslim mind exactly, and uh, I don't think the Jew is an eternal enemy, per se. The Jew, in, uh, mostly in uh, recent, uh, the recent century or so, became a kind of an enemy in many respects because of the uh, fight in Palestine slash uh, Israel. In previous generations or previous centuries, when Christianity actually challenged Islam, they would attack much, much more the Christian world than the Jews. The Jews were meaningless, basically. They would speak about them, deal with them, teach about them, but now there's a kind of a, an urge, a political urge, to really focus on them, which we have to keep in mind. Uh, so, Holger, but before, this is a point. Uh, Jewish sense of history, or the Torah sense of history, is not linear either. You have Abraham putting on tefillin before <coughs> Egypt. You have Jews living holidays. Uh, so I don't want to get into it, but the Torah is not a linear sense of history either. Yeah. Okay. I've got two questions. Uh, I'm wondering about the strictness of the Shia construction of uh, Iran, right?